Hello everyone and welcome to my complete guide to migratory natives in EU4. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down all of the migratory mechanics as well as go over the best strategies depending on your goals. With that being said guys, let's waste no more time and get into it. First, we're going to cover nation ideas. So the migratory tribes are broken up into different idea groups based on their regions. In North America, we have the Northwest, the Plains, American Southwest, California, Northeastern Woodlands, Southeastern, the Pueblo, and Cherokee. In South America, we have the Tupi, the Arawak, the Carib, the Tapuian, the Guarani, the Charon, Native Tribes, and Mapuche. And last but not least, in Australia, we have the Aboriginal, the Lorakia, the Tiwi, the Korna, the Aora, and the Camilleroy. All of these native nations additionally have randomized rulers at the start of the game, aside from the Cherokee being the only exception. This means that if you want to min-max your start in a game, you can continually restart until you get some good ruler stats. Also, I apologize for butchering all of those native names. Now we're going to briefly cover migrating and tribal land. So as a migratory native, you are restrained to having only one province. However, you are able to migrate your capital to a vacant province for only 50 military power. Once you are there, if that province has been unclaimed by any other tribe, you can add that to your tribal land for 100 admin power. Otherwise, the only way to gain tribal land from another native that has claimed it is to beat them in a war and take it in the peace deal. The bonus is that you don't actually have to spend that 100 admin power to make it your tribal land after the peace deal, you only have to spend your diplo power. The cost to migrate your capital is reduced by 10% for each negative stability you have. So it is a good option to sit at negative 3 stability at any point in time, bumping it up to negative 2 when you want to declare war. Keep in mind that if your capital province is currently not in part of your tribal territory, and you attempt to migrate to a province that is also not part of your tribal territory, the cost to migrate will go up by a factor of 1 for each subsequent times. So this can quickly get out of hand if you are trying to migrate away from your territory. The next thing we're going to talk about is tribal development. Think of tribal development as an artificial development modifier for any province that you migrate to. It will follow your capital around and give a bonus to development for each whole number of tribal development. If you have the tier 1 government reform chiefdom like the North American tribes do, you will be gaining a 0.02 bonus to your tribal development every single month. Additionally, every single nomadic tribe will get 0.02 per month by just grazing. By grazing and getting this 0.02 bonus, you are causing devastation in your capital province at a rate that is tied to your current tribal development. So a tribe with say 30 tribal development will cause devastation faster than a tribe with 9. Increasing your tribal development is one of the most important things that you can do as a migrating tribe. You can increase your monthly tribal development by a 0.02 by building the irrigation buildings in your main province. These have a base cost of 200. You can also increase your tribal development by an additional 0.08 every single month by grazing in a province that belongs to another nomadic tribe's territory. For this reason, it's extremely important to do this in order to maximize your tribal development growth. Alright, now that we've covered the basics, we're going to be going over reforms. Now, the reforms that we are going to be taking will depend on our end goal. So I will go over every single one of them, what is good and bad about them, and then tell you what I think would be the best options to take depending on what you want to do with your campaign. The tribes in North America start as either a Tier 1 Nomadic Tribe or a Tier 3 Settled Tribe. We're going to be talking mostly about the Tier 1 Nomadic Tribes, so the guide will be based off of those tribes. However, you can take what you learn here and adapt them to the Tier 3 Settled Tribes. Note that they can only gain tribal land through conquest. At Tier 2, we have Martial Tradition for 10% Infantry Combat Ability, Oral Tradition for 25% Reform Progress Gain, and Land Tradition for minus 25% cost to add tribal land. Let's quickly touch on the strengths and weaknesses of each before moving on. Our main goal as a native is to reform and consolidate our power in the New World before the Europeans arrive. For this reason, I would rate Oral and Land Tradition at a higher tier than Martial Tradition. Between Oral and Land Tradition, taking either should depend on whether you want to become a Horde, a Republic, or a Monarchy. We'll cover that in a little bit. At Tier 3, we have Warband for plus 5% morale and plus 15% land force limit. Seasonal Travel for migration cost minus 25% and a plus 0.02 to travel development gain. And Settle Down, which allows you to spend travel development with a minimum of a 1 and a maximum of 9 to settle some of your tribal land at the cost of 50 diplomatic power. Note that if you choose Settle Down at any time in your campaign, you will not be able to form a horde with your final reform. 
Let's quickly touch on the strengths and weaknesses of these before moving on. For the same reason as in Tier 2, Warband is outclassed by the other options. Settle Down allows us to distribute our development across multiple provinces, trade goods, and states. This gives us more income, which is important because the strongest part of this reform is the ability to build irrigation and longhouse buildings in each province that we settle, adding a flat 0 0.02 to travel development growth and a flat 0 0.1 to reform growth. Abusing these buildings allows us to gain tribal development extremely fast and settle in all of our tribal lands. However, when we run out of tribal land to settle, the strength of our tribal development diminishes. This reform also allows us to enact all subsequent reforms the quickest, due to building multiple longhouses and abusing the flat power grow. So by the time that we run out of tribal land, we may have already reformed. But you may also be missing out on the potential development from settling provinces if you reform too quickly. Seasonal travel is incredibly strong for increasing our tribal development as fast as possible, as well as gaining more tribal land which is important when enacting our final reform, as well as allowing us to settle those provinces if we switch to settle down later on. We'll cover tier 4 and 5 quickly before delving into the optimal strategies depending on our goals. At tier 4 we have codified power for a negative 2 to national unrest, diplomatic ceremonies for a plus 1 diplomatic relations, and trading with foreigners, which allows us to reform off of a neighboring European nation. Reforming this way immediately settles all of our tribal land as well as embraces all institutions that the colonizer has. We also gain the government type of the country that we reform off of, so we can easily get republic or monarchy depending on if we reform off of a colonial nation or the colonizer themselves. The tooltip also says that we will gain 10% core creation cost reduction. I believe this to be a bug and should not actually be there as there is no evidence that I've seen in my testing to prove that this actually happens. Note that you must be a settled down tribe to reform off of a colonizer. Again, let's touch on the strengths and weaknesses of each before moving on. Codified power and diplomatic ceremonies are equally good depending on if you want subjects or having issues with unrest. Because migrating natives tend to have the same religion of totemist, animist, or alcaringia, Depending on if you are in North or South America or Australia, it's likely slightly better to take diplomatic ceremonies for the additional diplo slots because your unrest will not likely be a thing. Reforming off of a colonizer is incredibly strong as it allows you to catch up on institutions instantly. There is no downside to this. This is probably one of the better reforms in the entire tree. Now for the tier five reforms. For tier five, we can choose between becoming a horde, a monarchy, a republic, or a theocracy. I'm not going to tell you to pick one over the other, this reform is all based on personal preference. Now let's talk about the reform tree as a whole depending on which government type that you want. Because of the cheaper reform progress cost, it is cheaper and all around better to reform off of a colonizer or colonial nation, if you want to become a republic or a monarchy. You can always switch your tier 4 government reform to trading with foreigners at any time. If you want to become a horde, you should take oral traditions in your tier 2, this will allow you to gain reform progress faster because you will not be able to increase this by building multiple longhouse buildings due to not being able to settle down. In your tier 3, take seasonal travel as settle down is unavailable and warband is unnecessary. In tier 4, take either, but I recommend diplomatic ceremonies. Lastly for tier 5, take the horde option. The horde option will also give you all of your tribal land as well as turn you into a horde so that you can raise provinces. If you want to become any other government type, what you take in tier 2 depends on if you want to reform quickly or want the maximum potential power. For a quick reform, take oral tradition for reform progress gain in tier 2. In tier 3, take settle down immediately. Settle your tribal lands and start building irrigation and longhouse buildings to gain reform progress and tribal development. In tier 4, reform off of a colonizer if you are able, otherwise take one of the other options. To reform, take a tier 5 reform or wait for a colonizer to arrive and switch to tier 4. For maximum power as a migrating tribe in tier 2, take land tradition to add more land to your tribal land for cheaper. The base cost is 100 admin power, so this reform saves you 25 per province. Even though we will get our tier 3 faster if we take oral traditions, because we will gain more reform progress when we settle down, land tradition is vastly superior. In tier 3, we take seasonal travel. This will let you migrate for cheaper and add more land to your tribe while also adding to your tribal development bonus. We take this reform and switch to settle down later on, when we are comfortable with our total tribal land and we've grown by it quite a bit. This lets us avoid running out of tribal land to settle too quickly and maximizes our bonus from tribal development. In tier 4 we want to wait for a colonizer to arrive. This lets us gain institutions instantly and saves us from having to develop them like we would if we took tier 5 reform. While we're waiting, we're continuing to settle our tribal land, making sure to add a maximum of 9 to our provinces every single time we settle. 
as well as building our bonuses in our buildings to try and get our reform progress to grow as much as possible. As an additional note on reform progress, because of the flat modifiers on long hauls, we're able to gain huge amounts of reform progress if we save a total of 1600 reform progress before taking our final reform. We'll be able to finish our new reform tree instantly if we choose to be a monarchy. But that's not where this gets broken. The big thing is expanding our administration. Typically during a campaign, we can expand our administration only a few times depending on our size. By delaying our final government reform as long as possible, we were able to gain insane amounts of governing capacity, making it almost obsolete. By abusing this mechanic, a world conquest should be pretty trivial, and we'll never have to worry about governing capacity ever again. Before we touch on our final topic, I'm going to briefly go over the idea groups that you should be taking as you progress through your campaign. First and foremost, the indigenous idea group is actually one of the strongest in the game, with some of the most coveted modifiers in almost every slot. Additionally, the policies that it has with other late game idea groups is insane, particularly the admin group. Whichever ideas you want to combo with this is up to you, but this is a must have for sure. The last thing I want to cover is native federations. Native federations function a bit differently than last patch and kind of function similar to the way the Holy Roman Empire does. You gain federation unity each month depending on the number of nations in your federation as well as the number of bordering federations. When this unity reaches 100, it'll have to be quick because there is no notification to let you know that you're sitting at the cap. You'll be able to choose from one of eight reforms that give you a variety of different bonuses. Federations seem to be a bit buggy as of right now as every nation that will join a federation will quickly leave it within a month or two. However, they are still useful. If you invite someone to a federation and they eventually leave, you'll be the leader of your own federation. This gives you a 10% bonus to morale of armies as well as one diplomatic reputation. These modifiers are actually pretty good and absolutely free. Eventually, you'll be able to get a few other modifiers by inviting people to federations and possibly breaking the bug. We'll touch on federations more in another video after they've fixed it up a bit. I hope this short video gave you guys a decent understanding of how natives work and summarized it pretty well. If you want a more in-depth and detailed look at how to abuse these mechanics, consider watching my next video. In this video, we're going to be playing as the Cherokee and doing the No Trail of Tears achievement. Now, this is an achievement that I have done once before when I first started playing this game without any of the DLC. But hopefully here, I'll be able to show you guys how to get this a lot easier than if you had the previous patch. That video will be linked at the top of the screen here with a card or at the end of the video. With that being said, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, I'll see you next time.